The year is 535 AD. In the grand halls of Constantinople, the air is thick with ambition. The Roman Empire, now centered in the east, is resurgent. Emperor Justinian, the first dreams of a restored world, a restitutio imperi, his brilliant general, Belisarius, has already reclaimed North Africa from the Vandals. Now, his gaze is fixed on Italy, the ancient heartland, currently held by the Ostrogoths. The system is working. Trade routes hum. Grain ships sail from Egypt. The Mediterranean is, once again, becoming a Roman lake. In Persia, the Sasanian Empire watches its rival with wary eyes. In the Americas, the great city of Teotihuacan thrives, and the classic Maya period is reaching its zenith. In the fragmented kingdoms of Britain, life is harsh, but predictably. The world of 535 AD is a complex machine, fragile, but functioning. It operates on a set of known rules. The sun rises, seasons change, crops grow, empires clash. This was the world as it was understood. This was the system. And then, in the year 536, the system stopped working. The sun did not rise. The glitch did not arrive with the crash of an asteroid or the march of an army. It arrived insidiously as a veil. In Constantinople, the historian Procopius, a man known for his critical FS, secular analysis of war, stopped writing about battles and started writing about the sky. He wrote, quote, and it came about during this year that a most dread portent took place, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness. Like the moon, during this whole year, he was not alone. In Italy, Cassiodorus, a Roman statesman, a high-ranking official whose very job was to manage the state's grain supply, wrote of the profound confusion, the sun, he said, seems to have lost its wonted light and appears of a bluish color. We marvel to see no shadows of our bodies. At noon, he described a sun that was gibbous as if in a permanent partial eclipse. This was not a one-day event. This was not a week. Procopius claims it lasted the entire year. Modern analysis points to 18 solid months Eighteen months of twilight. The mystery fog, as it's now known, was dense, persistent, and global. It was not localized to Europe. Reports from Ireland, the annals of Ulster, speak of a failure of bread in 536, far to the east. In China, the Nan Shi, history of the southern dynasties, records yellow dust raining down like snow. The annals state that the sun's light was obscured and the harvest failed. The immediate effect was cold. The fog was a shield, blocking the sun's radiation. In Italy, Cassiodorus wrote, the seasons seem to be all jumbled up together. Spring has not had its usual mildness, nor summer its heat. In China, they recorded summer snow and frost. In Peru, tree ring data shows 536 was the coldest year in 1500 years. The world, in unison, was plunged into a bitter, artificial winter. The first consequence was biological. Plants, starved of light and warmth, withered. The failure of bread in Ireland was not a metaphor, it was a reality. Global crop failures triggered a famine so profound, it echoed for a decade. The system of civilization, built on the reliability of the harvest, had just received its first critical error message, but this was only the beginning. 
The famine was just the symptom. The glitch was the darkness. What could blot out the sun for 18 months? For the people living through it, the answer was supernatural. This was divine wrath. The Fimble Winter of Norse mythology. The end of days. They were not entirely wrong. It was the end of their world. For centuries, the event of 536 AD was treated by historians as a bizarre, perhaps exaggerated, footnote, a curiosity of superstitious chroniclers. The problem is, the chroniclers were right. The system had glitched for decades. Modern science searched for the culprit. The main theories centered on two possibilities. Possibility one, an impact event, perhaps a comet, like Halley's Comet, which made an appearance in 530, had fragmented, and its debris field had shrouded the Earth in dust. This would explain the global nature and the dimming of the sun. It's dramatic. It's cinematic. But the evidence didn't quite fit. An impact large enough to create that much dust would have left other, more violent signatures. There were no widespread reports of explosions in the sky no massive crater found. Possibility 2. A terrestrial source. A volcano. This was the prevailing hypothesis. A single, cataclysmic volcanic eruption. So powerful, it injected a colossal amount of sulfur dioxide and ash into the stratosphere. There, high above the weather. These particles would not rain out. They would form a sulfuric acid aerosol a reflective veil, a global sunblock. The theory was sound, but it had a massive hole. If a volcano exploded with enough force to black out the sun for 18 months, an eruption that would dwarf Krakatoa or Pinatubo, where was it? There was no record of it. No supervolcano crater could be definitively dated to 536 AD. The search went cold. The 6th century historians were telling the truth, but the 21st century geologists couldn't find the murder weapon. The glitch remained an unsolved file until we learned how to read the most meticulous archive on the planet. Not a book, not a stone tablet, ice. In 2018, a team led by historian Michael McCormick and glaciologist Paul Miefsky analyzed a core sample from the Kale Nefeti Glacier in the Swiss Alps. This ice, drilled from a high-altitude pass, is a perfect time capsule. It captures atmospheric fallout with seasonal precision. As the team analyzed the layers, they zeroed in on the section corresponding to the early 6th century. And there, locked in the ice dated to the spring of 536 AD, they found it. The shrapnel, two microscopic particles of volcanic glass or tephra. Crucially, tephra acts as a chemical fingerprint. Its unique composition can be traced back to the specific volcano it erupted from. This was the forensic evidence. When analyzed, their unique chemical fingerprint pointed not to a local eruption in Italy or a Mediterranean volcano-like Vesuvius. The chemical signature pointed to Iceland. Suddenly, the picture snapped into focus. A massive, explosive eruption in Iceland, likely in early 536, had blasted its plume into the northern stratosphere. The prevailing winds did the rest, spreading the veil across the northern hemisphere, just as Procopius and the Chinese scribes had described. The ice core told another, even darker, story. The glitch of 536 wasn't a single event. It was a one to two punch. As the team looked further down the core, they found another massive sulfur spike. Dated to 540 or 541 AD, this one was chemically different, suggesting a second volcano, likely in the tropics, perhaps Ilopango in El Salvador which we know had a massive eruption around this time. This double tap 
plunged the world into the single coldest decade of the last 2,000 years. The Romans called it the Dark Ages. Modern scientists have a more precise term, the Lalia, the late antique Little Ice Age. And this is where the file reopens, because the fog, the cold, and the famine were not the final consequence. They were the precondition for something far worse. In 541 AD, five years after the sun first disappeared, the first reports emerged from the port of Pelusium in Egypt. This wasn't just any port. It was the main artery for the grain ships, the very system that fed Constantinople. A new, terrifying sickness. Bubuis. Fever. Delirium. Death. Yersinia pestis. The bubonic plague. It arrived in Constantinople in 542 AD, carried by the very grain ships that were supposed to feed the empire, Procopius, who had survived the dark sky. Now had to document a dying city, he wrote that 10, 0, 0, 0. People were dying every day. The plague, now known as the Justinian Plague, ripped through the Mediterranean world. The famine's consequence was twofold. First, it critically weakened the population, leaving their immune systems vulnerable to attack. Second, while the exact mechanism is debated, the environmental chaos and disrupted food chains likely accelerated the transfer of plague-carrying rodents into human centers. It killed, by some estimates, a third to a half of the population. This is the true detonation of the 536 glitch. Justinian's dream of a restored Roman Empire died. It died in the dark. It died of cold, starvation, and disease. His armies, now hollowed out, could no longer hold Italy. The world wasn't reset by a general or an emperor. It was reset by a climate cascade. A system failure triggered by an atmospheric glitch. The file on 536 AD is not a story about a volcano. It is a story about vulnerability. The civilization of 535 AD Roman. Persian. Mayan believed in its own permanence. It was built on a complex, interconnected system of agriculture, trade, and politics. And in 18 months, that system was broken, not by an army, but by a zero, 1% change in the atmosphere's reflectivity. The Dark Ages were not a choice. They were a consequence, a brutal, grinding decade of climate-induced collapse the historians who wrote about it, Procopius, Cassiodorus, were not superstitious. They were journalists, documenting the end of their world in real time. They were writing the first glitch file. The evidence, locked in the ice, tells us that a sudden non-linear shift is not a matter of if, but when the interconnected global system we have built today is infinitely more complex and perhaps infinitely more fragile than the one Justinian commanded. We rely on the same assumptions they did, that the sun will provide light, that the seasons will follow their course, that the climate will remain stable. The file of 536 AD is a forensic record of what happens when those assumptions fail. It is a cold case investigation that proves, without a shadow of a doubt, that civilization is a function of climate, and it leaves us with one final open question. If that glitch file runs again, would our system truly handle it any better?